So they have to hear and listen the Irish people's plight because this country is for Ireland. I mean, Ireland is for the Irish. And I'm sure now, if I say this kind of statement, what does he mean, Ireland is for the Irish? Is he a far right? I've never seen a black man who's a far right in the world. If you think I'm saying this statement and if you consider that I'm a far right, so be it. And so help me God. Why do people are sick and tired of the government's refugee settlement in, 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 in Ireland? Number one, cost of living. Number two, we have... 13,185 homeless people in this country. While the Irish are struggling to find a better accommodation for themselves, but the people from Ukraine or, you know, coming to this country and having all those housing. But when I see somebody that came recently from somewhere and been accommodated by, by the council, who is not Irish citizen, you are an Irish citizen, you have the right, a natural right in this country to be looked after by your government. But then when you see people that don't have Irish citizenship, that don't have any relation with the Republic of Ireland getting everything, why can't you be angry? This is not about jealous. I'm not jealous. And I'm sure you're not jealous. We are not jealous. I mean, if anybody comes to this country, work hard, study hard, and contribute to the economy, good luck. We're happy. But when you come to this country and, your and, the, and, and our own government in this country favoring certain individuals, group of people, than their own citizens, something is not right with the government. Well, welcome back, everybody. I am here with Dr. Mahari Faseha, who is a PhD in migration studies and a number of other subjects. And we're going to be talking to him about some of the claims that Tisha Gliovaradkar has made recently about what the Dublin regulation actually says and Ireland's asylum situation more broadly. And so we'll be very interested to hear his perspective on some of these matters. So thank you so much for joining us today, doctor. Thank you very much, Ben, for having me. So for the benefit of our audience at home who might not be familiar with your work, could you sort of summarize your academic career and your credentials in this particular area that we're discussing, immigration and human rights law and so on? When it comes to PhD, my first PhD was from Masaryk University uh, from Czech Republic, PhD in social policy and social work. And the second master's um, was PhD in international migration studies from University of Granada, Spain. And the third PhD is um, PhD in um, International Development Studies from University of Pretoria. And the fourth PhD is PhD in International Human Rights Law and Fundamental Freedoms from Universidad de Zaragoza. So I believe in addition to that, you've received awards, uh, various awards and accolades during your academic career. I believe you've even received a, an award in European diplomacy from former Irish president Mary Robinson. Would I be right in saying that? Yeah, you're absolutely right there. Uh, in 2017, there was a European competition of debates in uh, Warsaw, Poland. And then I had the opportunity to represent the Republic of Ireland in debates. And then uh, I, got, I, got, I, got, uh, I got a number one in, in, in that debate. And then Mary Robinson traveled uh, all the way from Kinshasa, the Congo, which is the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, to, to give uh, those, uh, those award in, in Poland. So what I wanted to ask you about specifically was the Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, made a number of claims recently as to what the international migration laws actually say, specifically regarding asylum seekers and refugees. And he labeled a number of positions myths. He said that there's a lot of widespread far-right myths that have been uh, adopted by people that actually have no basis in truth. And so I'm wondering if you could respond to those myths and, and see what the Taoiseach has gotten correct and what he might have gotten incorrect, if anything, and, and just genuinely hear your opinion on these matters. So first of all, he said that the claim that refugees have to claim asylum in the first safe country they reach in Europe under the Dublin regulation is misinformation. The level of misinformation is very worrying and no opinion is allowed misinformation in my view. You know, I, I even heard on, on the radio this morning, um, you know, people saying uh, that um, uh, asylum seekers have to claim asylum uh, in the first safe country they enter. Like, that is a far-right myth. 
um, that is being perpetrated broadly. People are not under any obligation uh, to claim asylum in the first safe country they enter. It is possible under the Dublin regulation uh, for people to be sent back to a country that they've already applied in if that country will take them, but that's a whole other thing. What, what, what is your position on that? Uh, I just want to first you know, uh, explain what Dublin Convention is all about. Dublin Convention came first in uh, June 15th, 1990, and then it came to force uh, on the 1st of September 1997, uh, after seven years. And what does actually Dublin Convention mean is clearly that an asylum seeker uh, or a refugee in, in general term, um, before seeking asylum, especially because we are now based in Europe, uh, the first point of country is the place where he should seek asylum. That is what it means, Dublin Convention. And then when he seeks asylum in those first point of entry countries, he should be taken his fingerprints and identities uh, so that it can be stored in the Eurodac form in the Luxembourg. So Dublin Convention is a process where to discourage asylum seekers, refugees from asylum shopping. That's what Dublin Convention is all about. Now, we can argue also that the member states who received the first, uh, in, in the first point of entry on asylums are those countries are responsible to assess and examine those refugees. But in this condition, when the Tishak was saying uh, misinformation, I, I would love to know what, what was or where the misinformation uh, was given because um, the Dublin Convention is clearly, uh, cl I mean, it's a, straight, it's a straightforward uh, regulations whereby member states of the first point of entry are the, the responsible to assess and examine the asylum claims of those refugees. Now, in the Taoiseach's defense, might he say, if he was here listening to this, that the obligation is on the state that if you first arrive in Italy, for example, Italy is responsible for applying, you, you, uh, re registering your application, but that there's no obligation on you as the asylum seeker. You can do whatever you like, and really it's more of a, a, an obligation on the nation in particular that you've arrived in. What, what would you say to that? And, that? and then what's the point of having Dublin Convention then? Why did we bring this not Dublin Convention? Why did we encourage member states of the European Union to sit in Brussels or Strasbourg to make a decision on the common European asylum policy? There's no point having Dublin Convention, according to the Taoiseach's argument. So the reason why we have Dublin Convention is that to stop asylum seekers from asylum shopping. That's number one. Number two, to encourage us, um, member states, you know, to assess and examine on the first point of entry on those asylum seekers. So according to the Taoiseach, then there's no point of having Dublin Convention and we don't even have to talk about Dublin Convention at all. So the other thing that the Taoiseach might bring up is the fact that there, I, I, my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, there are some exceptions within the Dublin regulation and the Dublin Convention that I think there might be some exceptions for family reunification if, if a minor, again, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but my understanding is that if a minor was to arrive into a European country uh, and then his parents had already claimed asylum in another country, he could ask to be... Uh, reunited with them and that there is a mechanism for that within the law. So maybe the Taoiseach would argue that uh, it's too sim <coughs> oversimplified to say that, oh, people have to stop at the first safe country. There are exceptions and nuances there. What, what would you say in response to that? Well, there, there could be some exceptions on the family reunification sections, okay? That does not mean literally that the Dublin Convention, according to the Taoiseach's argument, that anyone could pass any country of first point of entry and seek asylum uh, to other parts of, 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 of Europe. So you cannot bring those exceptions in order to defend the bigger picture of Dublin Convention. And so uh, according to the head of state, uh, Mr. Leo Vararkar, I think uh, in my point of view, he, he, should, he should get a better advice on what Dublin Convention and what it constitutes. Um, on, on the European asylum common, uh, on the common European asylum policy, uh, to me, I think he's, he wasn't getting the, the the best information and advice on that. Uh, so sometimes uh, he could just be making uh, su such kind of um, opinion or suggestions without uh, paying attention the the, the the future impact. 
So would you say it's fair to say then that the Taoiseach was mistaken when, when he said that this is misinformation? Would you say that... Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think he misunderstood what Dublin Convention is all about. According to his arguments, what he said is that, I mean, that there's no point for me uh, if, 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 if according, to his heart, according to his argument, there's no point of having Dublin Convention then. So we, we shouldn't talk about Dublin Convention at all. Now, the other claim he made, which I thought was interesting, was that we don't have open borders. He said that this is a myth that is largely, largely uh, spread by, by people in society, that Ireland has a kind of an open border policy. And his, his way of uh, reinforcing his point was he said that we have very robust checks at the airport. Uh, we even have checks for people coming off planes, uh, you know, th th things of that nature to ensure that their documents are valid. Uh, do, do you have any response to that claim? What, what, what do you think of that? Yeah, but I mean, which refugees are we talking about? Which, which types of migrants are we talking about when you talk about uh, open, op, open border policy? I mean, no other, I mean, in, in the European Union, no countries have an open border policy. I mean, including, including Ireland too. But then when it comes to the Ukrainians in particular, there was an open border policy. And anybody from Ukraine can just travel from Ukraine or from the neighboring countries, from Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, Belarus, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Slovakia, uh, where I believe the Ukrainians were supposed to seek asylum there, because those are the responsible states to look after the, the Ukrainians' uh, uh, asylum. But I don't understand why the Ukrainians passing through all those five, six countries to seek asylum uh, in Ireland. I've got nothing against any, any refugees coming to Ireland. I mean, if they could, they could come. And, and seek asylum, but they have to follow the international procedures and, of course, the, 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 the Irish law um, when they seek asylum. Uh, so, for me, uh, Ukrainians coming from Ukraine, they pass through the neighboring countries, that's a point of entry. So, I don't understand if you pass through those five, six countries and buy ticket and fly straight to Ireland, that means there must be something, a hidden agenda to seek asylum in Ireland, which I don't know. And I have to be very very, very cautious uh, under what international regime that the Ukrainians are refugee in Ireland. I mean, under, is, is it temporary? Is it permanent? What, what, what sort of refugee status they have? Are they, if, we call, if we say some particular group of refugees are refugees, then under what regime? Mm -hmm. You have to be very, very, very clear because um, do they have refugee status of the 1951 conventions? Do they fulfill the 1951 Geneva Conventions relating to the status of refugees and its protocol? I don't know. We have to ask questions because I've got a lot of reservations when it comes to the way that the Ukrainians sought asylum in Ireland um, and, 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 and being given all types of treatment uh, because I don't have any problem to, I, I mean, that the Ukrainians are getting all those kind of treatments, but then it has to be also uh, fair and equal with other refugees seeking asylum in Ireland because it's obvious that certain group of people are getting full attentions uh, from the government and certain people of group also don't get any full attention. So I just want to know under what international regime or law or refugee law that Ukrainians are called refugees because to my understanding in order to be a refugee you have to be persecuted. It's not only persecuted, you have to fulfill five requirements. I mean, when you leave your country, either you have to be due to race, nationality, membership of social group, uh, political opinion, and uh, religion. You have to be persecuted in one of these. But I'm just wondering, Ukrainians, yes, they have a war, but under no circumstances in International Refugee Law Convention of the 1951, war was mentioned. So I have a very critical question to the government of Ireland. The other claim that the Taoiseach said was a myth was that there are no security checks on international applicants, uh, international protection applicants who are coming into Ireland. And he said that they're photographed and fingerprinted and then they're checked against a database to see if they've applied for asylum in another country or if they have a criminal record. Um, and so on that basis, the government is doing its due diligence as far as security and, and, and ensuring that everybody who comes in here should be here and is a safe person who isn't going to pose a danger to the state. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, does he refer to the Ukrainian refugees or does he refer to the entire refugee process? We have to be very clear. 
and understanding his point of view. I believe, I believe early in the Ukraine war, when it had first broken out, Michal Martin, who at the time was the Taoiseach, <coughs> said during an interview that there wasn't security being done on Ukrainians in particular. He said that the, the primary impulse of the Irish state was to help them and to kind of worry about the security side of it later. You in Ireland have welcomed already something like two and a half thousand Ukrainians so far. Have you conducted security checks on them? We've had about five and a half thousand. Five and a half thousand. Yeah, in, 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 into Ireland um, at this stage. Uh, no, we're, 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 you know we will have we, we will monitor and so on. But no, our, our primary impulse is to assist those fleeing war, um, and um, and that's you know the, the Irish people are very seized by this the, the series of atrocities that are going on. What we're witnessing on our screens every evening. It's really shocking people and there's huge human empathy there obviously uh, to help the women and the children and so we, we, because of the temporary protective directive of the European Union, what Ireland is doing basically if Ukrainians come into Ireland they'll have access to our social protection uh, income, uh, access to our health services, access to education, uh, the right to work immediately um, and, and uh, we believe that's the correct thing to do in the context of the worst displacement of people and refugee crisis since World War II. Um, and, um, you know, that, and speed is important in a situation like this. So on that basis, do, does that, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, man, I mean, you can't just bring anyone from any war-torn country and do then the security check letter. You have to do it on the spot and to determine whether they are refugee or not, or whether they are a threat to the state and to the well-being and welfare of the Irish people. And then, then you assess the ex the, their claims. But what the government, under the Michal Martin's administration, was on the, the other way around. You let the people in, they, once, they are let in once they are in the country, you don't know those people. That's, 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 that's a very shocking um, uh, suggestion from the Taoiseach then, uh, Michal Martin saying that let, let us bring all these refugees and then we do the security check, check letter. I mean, which country in the European Union does this? The other thing that Tisha Gliavaradkar has said is that some rejected asylum claims are allowed to stay in Ireland on humanitarian grounds. The, the Department of Justice has admitted that there are people whose claims are rejected yeah. and then they're allowed to stay in the state. So is that not making a joke of Irish immigration law and border control? No, it doesn't, because it does depend on, 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 the, on different circumstances. So sometimes people will have their application for refugee status refused, but they will be gra granted leave to remain on humanitarian grounds. Uh, so, for example, uh, there are some countries that it's illegal to leave. Uh, there are some countries that won't take people back. Uh, even if you try to deport them, they won't take them back. So it's not often the way it's presented uh, in, in the media. Um, if you work in this area, if you understand this area, if you meet people and understand their individual circumstances, it does depend. Uh, there may be people who are refused refugee status because they're not genuine refugees, but it may still be the case that they can't be returned home uh, for other reasons, uh, and they're then allowed to stay on humanitarian grounds. Do, do you have any uh, insight into that or the... the validity of that as a concept? Well, you see, uh, in many parts of Europe and in, in many parts of the, 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 the convention itself, when an asylum seeker uh, failed in, in, its, in his or her own um, claims by the state, the state has the responsibility to, to, to get rid of him off out of the country. But again, every country has its own policy. Uh, based on humanitarian uh, on norms and conditions, you could actually leave the asylum seekers, he may not fulfill the requirements of the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugee and its protocols requirements. However, we believe that he or she should get humanitarian protection from the state. That is normal in most, most countries in the European Union. So if Ireland follows that, that, that routine, uh, I would say that is a correct. Uh, so uh, there are People that I know in this country stayed 10, 11 years in a hostel and their asylum uh, application was invalid. But then because they have stayed long in the country and they have wasted, well, quarter of their lives in a hostel, then the government like kind of pardoned them to say, well, look, you've been staying in the country for some time. We know that you don't fulfill the requirements to be a refugee, but then we will grant you a humanitarian remain to live. That's what it's called, humanitarian remain to live. Then based on that, 
yes, those people could get uh, those kind of uh, uh, refugee status. So is it possible that that's the policy that the government is pursuing with the Ukrainians, that even if they're not particularly adhering to this or that convention in a very technical sense, that the government is saying, well, look, on humanitarian grounds, we're going to look after them because it's just the humane thing to do? Is, is that possible? Well, no. This is two, two different things. The one I explained earlier was those who failed asylum seekers. The Ukrainians are not failed asylum seekers. They just came. Were they interviewed? I've never seen any Ukrainian were called by the Department of Justice, Equality and Law Reform, I don't know if that's the name now they have, been interviewed why they left the country. There is what we call blanket international protection for Ukrainian refugees. They come to the country, they will be provided housing, food, medical care, schooling and everything. So this is completely different. That's why I've asked you last, I mean, earlier that under what international regime that the Ukrainian refugees are protected in Ireland? Are they temporary protection? Are they permanent? Under what? We are not told by, the, by, by our government uh, per se, because I, I really want to know under what international regime that these refugees from Ukraine are protecting in Ireland because are they refugees to start with? Because uh, like I said, like I explained to you earlier, refugees should fulfill the five requirements. Were they persecuted by their country? And if they do, then would they uh, fulfill the five requirements? Were they called by the Department of Justice to have an interview why they left the country? Did they have to explain all that? Like any other African refugees or Asian or Latin American refugees coming from those countries to Ireland. So we have to be very critical when it comes to immigration because this is a very sensitive issue. One of the other policies that we have here in Ireland is the policy of asking people to self-deport. This has been a policy that the Department of Justice has explicitly outlined, as has the Justice Minister, that uh, most people, uh, the, the vast majority of people who are quote-unquote deported in Ireland are simply given a deportation order and then asked to leave the state and that it's the understanding of the Irish state that many of them do, although even Department of Justice officials who are working in the immigration field have admitted that they don't have exit checks, so they don't actually confirm that this person has left the state. So it's more of a sort of uh, estimation as to how many leave. They can't give precise numbers. The obligation is on people to remove themselves from the state, and many people do. Mm. Um, uh, and therefore, it's not the case that every deportation order that's issued is automatically comes to the point where um, it requires the removal of a person from the state. Many people voluntarily um, remove themselves. We can't be precise about of how many actually do because we don't have uh, exit checks. Is that a requirement? Uh, does the government have to have a policy like that or could they theoretically put every single person who's deported on a plane and send them to, to whichever country that they've uh, come to Ireland from? Is, is, that, uh, is there a rule around that? Uh, you see, when they say self-deport, like how, for example, if I'm a failed asylum seeker in Ireland, how would I deport myself? Because I've been living, let's say, I've been living in a, in a refugee camp or accommodation center. <coughs> as, as you know, asylum seekers are, now, are not allowed to work in the country. And then how would you deport yourself back to your country where you fled from? And also many of them don't have uh, travel documents. Travel documents. So now, if you uh, deport, say, a Somalian or, I don't know, a Zimbabwean, uh, without a proper document, those countries could say, well, how do we prove that he is from Zimbabwe or from Somalia or from Eritrea or from Ethiopia or from Sudan? Uh, how do we prove? So it is very uh, technical and very difficult to determine uh, when you deport a person to in certain countries, those countries may refuse. And, and it's going to be also expensive for the state to deport. How many people are you going to, to deport? You know? So do you think the self-deportation policy is a practical one? That they're, they're saying, look, it's just not logistically feasible to send people back? Or is there some regulation that's binding them, that's telling them, no, you have to do this under EU law or whatever it might be? <coughs> like, look, self-deportation, for me, it's, it's not feasible. Because 
I've never seen anyone that goes to the government and say, well, look, I want to self-deport. But like, how am I going to deport myself? Or like if, if I go back to the government and say, I want to go back home, will you pay my ticket and, and all that? That could happen, but who would do that? Mm. So, so would you say that it's, it's, it will be wiser for the government to forcibly deport people in so far as that's possible to, to physically have the Gardaí take the person and put them on a plane and ensure that they have left the state? Would that be the more re reasonable way of going about it? Well, it could be a bit challenging doing that. I mean, going to someone's uh residential area with with the police force drug the person put him in plane uh, uh that would that wouldn't look or sound good to me personally but again there are there probably we have some sort of uh, arrangements uh with iom the international organization for migration whereby they facilitate um self-deportation I don't know if the government have that option to consult with the IOM because the IOM responsibility is that when an asylum seeker is sick and tired of a state and then he wants to go back, if he does, then he approaches the IOM or the government approach IOM and the IOM interfere between the government and the refugee and then facilitate by giving him a temporary UN documents to send him back. In that way, things will work out better and diplomatically rather than bringing military force and dragging a person that doesn't look good to, I to Ireland. And do you think it would be wise for the government to have exit checks on asylum seekers or, or, or migrants in general who have been deported to confirm that they have in fact left the state once this process has, has under, uh, been, been undergone basically. Because as I say right now, they freely admit that they don't have any such checks. So it's sort of, you, you, you tell somebody, all right, deport yourself. And then whatever happens next is anyone's guess. That's kind of the current state of play. They don't have figures on how many have left and how many haven't. But don't you think this is a failure of the government's policy? Because they don't have the record of who left the country or who, who comes in the country. I mean, because the government has the responsibility to control and check who is in the country and who left the country. It's the government's responsibility to safeguard the territorial integrity of this country and its people. So this, for me, is a part of the failure of the Minister of Justice and its cabinet. The other thing that we hear a lot about is the fact that there are other countries in Europe which are comparable to Ireland in many ways, which have approached the asylum seeker issue very differently. So for example, Denmark, which has a population roughly similar to Ireland, about 5.9 million citizens in Denmark compared to our 5 million, uh, they've taken about half as many asylum seekers as us per capita. But whenever the government is confronted on the issue of migration, uh, they, their response is always basically that this is out of our hands, we have to do what we're doing currently. There's just no other option. We're bound by, as they say, international <coughs> obligations. I'm wondering how much of what we're seeing is actually an obligation on the government and how much of it is voluntary uh, on their part. Because again, why is it that other countries can do seemingly a lot less and they don't seem to be falling afoul of any of these regulations or rules? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? What is, what, under what international obligation they have? No one is ob ob obliging you to take refugees. You are doing it because of out of uh, kindness and humanitarian. Now, let me give you a very good example. How many refugees that the Hungarian government took? Very, very limited, if any. Were they obliged to take those refugees? Look, migration and asylum is basically a gesture, a humanitarian assistance to refugees and asylum seekers. No country is obliged. They, I mean, they are part of the international regime of refugee protection of the 1951 conventions. And Ireland is part of the United Nations and they have signed and ratified the 1951 conventions. Ireland has the responsibility to protect refugees. But that does not mean Ireland is forced to take anyone and everyone. We have to be very selective when we are approaching refugee issues. We have to think about 
the housing crisis in this country. We have to think about our social welfare system in this country. We have to think about our educational system in this country. We have to think about our employment rate in this country. We have to think about how are we going to deal with the coming influx of refugees in this country. Based on these circumstances, we are going to take a certain amount of refugees. Unless otherwise we can't just say, oh, we Ireland is obliged to take such amount of refugees from Brussels. Ireland is a sovereign, independent state. No one forced Ireland in any international conventions unless otherwise our, the Irish government bow itself for a certain government. Now, if a representative of the government was here, what they might say is that we're obliged to at least listen to asylum cases should people arrive in Ireland. So we don't have to accept everybody, but if they come here and they put their hand up and say, I would like to claim asylum in the Republic of Ireland, it's required that we at least process their claim, listen to them, and then at that point, after we've made a determination whether they're valid or invalid, we can make a decision as to whether they can stay here. But from that perspective, if tens of thousands of people are arriving over a couple of years, which is what we've seen, then <coughs> Would, would we not be required to house these people all over the country while we're processing those claims? Uh, or or is, is that uh, something that, again, we're obliged to do as a state, would you say? But this, this is, uh, the thing I found very difficult is that, uh, like I said, every country, I mean, like the Danish government, uh, they have a very strict asylum policy. The Netherlands, the government, they have a very strict uh, asylum policy. But we don't see that kind of uh, immigration problem in those countries. Why is it hard for the Irish government to come up with a very straight solution to accommodate and to give protection for refugees? It seems to me the immigration or the migration or the refugee crisis in Ireland is becoming out of hand because there's no a system whereby who is refugee and who is not a refugee. And under what circumstances refugees has to be, have to be uh, recognized in Ireland? Do we have the trace and truck check and balance who is in the country, who is out of the country, and how are we going to integrate? One part is now integration. You see, we don't have a problem. I, I, I mean, I personally, I'm, I'm an immigrant myself, but then uh, I don't have to see people. I mean, I, I've got no problem of seeing people coming to Ireland, but then once they are in Ireland, how the government going to integrate these refugees. There's also an, a problem of integration. There's a language barrier. There's a cultural difference. How are we going, because these are the future of Ireland. They are going to stay in this country. They are going to build this country, economically, politically, socially, culturally, financially. But then how, how does the government invest in these people and then get something out of it? You see, migration is two way. You bring people in this country, but you will make sure that those people come into this country, educate themselves, work for the country, work for themselves, for their family, and build the nation. You have, you have to see migration from long-term plan because there's nothing free. The American government takes thousands and thousands of refugees from Kakuma camp in Kenya, the Somalis, the Ethiopians, the Eritreans, to America, to Canada, to Australia. Why do they do that? Because they want them to come to America and then they let them to work and build the nation. And America gets economic boom from those migrants. But this is not the case in Ireland. The integration part should be very, very carefully analyzed and assessed. We can't just bring people down in this country just because Ireland is, is a humanitarian country. But then what's the long-term plan? Do you think it's fair to say that Ireland um, offers too much when it comes to our asylum system because I've had interactions with asylum seekers. I was speaking to a man from Egypt uh, who was living in uh, an asylum center that was in Dublin city center. This was about a year or two ago. And I was interviewing him about his story and how he got here. And he said that he had lived in the UK for about 10 years uh, as an asylum seeker. He, he by, by his own words, said he had been working on the quote unquote black market and that Eventually, after Brexit, he wanted to travel around the European Union and the travel rules had become a little bit more difficult for him. And so he heard that the Irish justice minister was offering 
visas to people who claimed asylum in this country and so on that basis he came to Dublin and he claimed asylum here. I came from uh, England. I live in England around 15 years. I work there uh, in black, uh, black market, but when I, when I hear about uh, Ireland and I hear about the justice minister in, in, in uh, Ireland, uh, they open uh, for everyone for, to get uh, a visa uh, for asylum seeker. Uh, and I think it's, it's a good country to, to get a visa from here. So do you think then the reason you came to Ireland from England was the opportunities that were available in Ireland? I think yes, yeah. Now this is obviously, I think most people would agree, a farcical situation, but you hear a lot of claims like this and even the government now is admitting that because we offer more in social welfare, or at least we did until very recently, to people who are claiming asylum, uh, that is kind of creating a, a, a pull factor for people when they're looking at where am I going to claim asylum. Uh, Spain doesn't offer too much, this country doesn't offer too much, Ireland is the place I'll go. Do you think that we're going above and beyond what we're actually required to do here? Yeah, this is, this is what I've been always saying. Ireland does not have migration policy. Ireland doesn't have. You see, um, if other countries have a very strict asylum policy, why can't Ireland has the same? Now, Ireland should abide by international law in giving protection to those who deserve international protection. But that doesn't mean that Ireland should do beyond it means its means, you know? So there must be a cap where Ireland should assess, examine everybody's asylum claim in this country and treat those according to the law of the country. And it should be always, as I always say, it should be equal to every citizens of the world. You cannot just treat one type of asylum seeker refugees than a different one from other parts of the world because this is obviously discrimination. I mean, if you see, I mean, so it's, it, does, it won't look good for the Irish government and even for the Irish people as well. Because and, and do you think that's happening with Ukraine, that, that Ukrainians are receiving preferential treatment over people over, from other parts of the world? Yes, well, that, that's what I'm saying. It's an, it's an obvious, I don't know if you call it racism. I don't know if you call it... Uh, actually, the, the government is, 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 is making uh, an obvious racism. Uh, than the, the, the people because the, I, I don't see the people have any problem or any issue of, of migrants but then the government has a preferential uh, way of okay we're gonna treat these refugees because they are from Europe they look like us and then you have people from Afghanistan or, or Syria or, or Africa they don't look like us they have to stay in in, a, in accommodation center and then who's racist the government or the people one of the other things I wanted to ask you about was Fine Gael Junior Minister Neil Richmond, who was speaking about the upcoming referendum to redefine the family within the Irish constitution and expand its definition to a more vague term that, that the family would be based on uh, durable relationships rather than marriage. And what Richmond was saying was that this would have a serious impact on Irish immigration law because it would effectively have an impact on family reunification. If an asylum seeker comes here and they want to bring their relatives from abroad, that there would be a new, broader definition of family. And this is what I want to get to the key point of changing what the definition of family is. This is moving to not just modern time vernacular, but it has serious consequences, particularly when we think of immigration law and proving that someone is family member or family reunification, this will allow that to be accommodated as well. So we're keeping up to space with other uh, communities. Because you're talking about durable relationships. Absolutely, yeah. Is this I'm wondering what, what you think of that comment and uh, the potential ramifications of that were something like that to, to pass into our constitution. Well, uh, you see, bringing that kind of law into the constitution is very dangerous. The future ramification would be uh, very dangerous because anyone that come in this country and seek asylum, they would probably sue the government in everyday basis, and how many uh, how many court cases will be uh, will be will be in the high court or supreme court and on, on this on this issue and and the taxpayers money also going to that issue because uh, the ramification the, the future ramification would be devastated. So you think that uh, asylum seekers would take the Irish state to court, effectively saying, "Well, look, 
this is how a family is defined in the constitution. I want to bring my family from the country I fled and I want to bring these relatives and uh, you're not allowing me to do that so therefore you're violating my my rights under the Irish constitution. Would, would that be a potential outcome that you could foresee? And then who would pay the legal cost for asylum seeker? It would be the, the Irish public, the taxpayer. So how many asylum seekers do we have in this country? About 120,000 or so. So then 100,000 people will, 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 will sue the government and how might that will be? Three, four billion? Well, I believe uh, Fine Gael, uh, Minister for Immigration of several years ago in 2017 or 2018, David Stanton, he said that the average number of uh, family members that asylum seekers apply to bring over is about 20 and that the, ho the highest they ever received was over 70, that one individual wanted to bring his entire extended family and everybody he ever met basically uh, back, back from his home country. Um, and that was an argument he made at the time trying to basically argue why the government wouldn't expand family reunification uh, because it would be a bad idea and it would be unsustainable and would have negative impacts on housing and so on. That, that was the claim the government made just a couple of short years ago and now we have this referendum and we have a government junior minister who's effectively telling us that this will have a similar impact and it will make it easier for people to bring their relatives from abroad. So um, again, I'm wondering, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I should ask the minister also to help me to bring all my family from, from my village, if that is the case, because I would love to have my family from Africa, all of them maybe, 80 extended family, would they, will they allow me to do that? I suppose you have durable relationships with all of them, so under the constitution, why not? Yeah, well, we'll see, that time will tell. So, does GDP is a factor to be told by the EU, Brussels, elites, whether you have to have certain amount of refugees or not? That depends on the current government. You see, the, all asylum issues, determined by the current government you have in the country. How does the Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and the Green government view the asylum policy? How does the government of the Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and the Green government diplomatically talk with the, the, the people from Brussels? Are we just take, like, are we just take everything that we are told from the Brussels elite about the issue when it comes to migration. Is Ireland actually, this is the question I, I, I've been puzzled, is Ireland an experiment state for the EU, for refugees? Because it seems to me that every refugee coming to this country with high amount of numbers, but then comparing with other countries, there's a, there's, there's, there's a serious uh, fluctuation that why Ireland, why Ireland receiving all those refugees, not, not other countries, number one. Number two, why don't the people of Ireland voice, the Irish voice are not heard by the government? Because this government is not only for the Irish government, it's also for the Irish people. The Irish people's voice should be considered. On that, I, I wanted to ask you about that because obviously the temperature of the debate when it comes to immigration has reached a, a very high level recently and we've seen a, a growing frustration in communities we've seen these protests all over the country in some terrible cases and obviously everybody condemns this we've even seen buildings that were potentially earmarked for asylum seekers being burned and obviously that's unacceptable but the fact of the matter is I think there's a, a, a sense out there among a lot of people that they're just being totally ignored by the government and that their legitimate frustrations that they have are falling on deaf ears and so people are just getting angrier and angrier and in fact uh, Tishak Leo Varadkar he was talking a couple of months ago about community engagement and he said that he wanted to make it clear that community engagement so far as he he's concerned is all about simply informing communities about what's going to happen and making sure they have correct information and dispelling misinformation as he sees it but that it's not about seeking permission. This is going to happen to your community, whether you like it or not, and you, we, we'll basically talk you through it and we'll help you to understand w w what's taking place, but you don't really have the option to veto it. He said this many times. The purpose of the community engagement team is to improve the flow of information regarding arrivals into areas and to help equip lo local communities 
with the information required to help them understand the current situation and to assist with the welcome and integration process for new arrivals. It's not a case that community engagement is about seeking permission uh, from communities as to whether people are going to move into their area. It is about information, dispelling misinformation you, and responding to genuine worries. Do you think that that's contributing to a, a social division that we're seeing forming and, and a, a kind of an anger that, that we're seeing grow in so many towns across this country? I don't know if you have heard the current news from Mayo. The Mayo Council clearly reject any refugees coming to, to, to that area. I don't know if you heard the council said, well, look, we're not going to entertain any kind of um, making decisions from, from Dublin to receive more asylum seekers, or if you call them refugees, I don't know. Uh, so the Mayor Council is the first council in Ireland that rejects any proposal by the government to bring more refugees in, in, in Mayo area. Now, why do people are sick and tired of the government's refugee settlement? In, in, in Ireland. Number one, cost of living. Number two, we have 13,185 homeless people in this country. While the Irish are struggling to find a better accommodation for themselves, but the people from Ukraine or, you know, coming to this country and having all those housing. I'm an Irish citizen. I don't have a house. I'm looking for one from the council. If they give me one, I will be very happy. But when I see somebody that came recently from somewhere and been accommodated by, by the council, who is not Irish citizen, I am an Irish citizen. You are an Irish citizen. You have the right, a natural right in this country to be looked after by your government. But then when you see people that don't have Irish citizenship, that don't have any relation with the Republic of Ireland getting everything, why can't you be angry? This is not about jealous. I'm not jealous. And I'm sure you're not jealous. We are not jealous. I mean, if anybody comes to this country, work hard, study hard, and contribute to the economy, good luck. We're happy. But when you come to this country and, your go and, and, and our own government in this country favoring certain individuals, group of people, than their own citizens, something is not right with the government. And I am very, very, very critical and seriously say the government of this country should think twice, if not four times, to help the people of this country. Because, because of the Irish people, the government is there in their power. If it wasn't for the Irish government, they don't have a place in their political uh, arena where they are now. So they have to hear and listen the Irish people's plight because this country is for Ireland. I mean, Ireland is for the Irish. And I'm sure now, if I say this kind of statement, what does he mean, Ireland is for the Irish? Is he a far right? I've never seen a black man who's a far right in the world. If you think I'm saying this statement and if you consider that I'm a far right, so be it. And so help me God. Thank you so much, Professor. It was great talking to you. Thank you very much, sir, for having me.